I have presented across the state of Texas a lecture that I uh, talk about, um, or that I've entitled, How Texas Won the Civil War. Now, this may come as news to many people, but I want to bear with me and I'll explain how Texas won the Civil War. Before we do that, though, we'd better talk a, a little bit about legal background. You know, what, what does it mean to cause uh, the war, and what does it mean um, in terms of Texas causing the Civil War? Because not only did Texas win the Civil War, but it caused it. Here's how I mean. All right. Legally, there's essentially two constructs. There's causes in fact or proximate causes. So, for instance, uh, a cause in fact might be, uh, but for slavery, the war may not have come. Or, but for ambiguity in the Constitution, the war may not have come. Or, but for cultural and sectional differences or economic differences, the war may not have come. Okay, so those are causes in fact. And they may, in fact, be causes of the Civil War. But there's also proximate causes that we need to think about. Uh, and proximate causes are those that are closest to the actual harmful event. Uh, so, for instance, secession <laughs> clearly causes the Civil War. Uh, the firing on Fort Sumter clearly causes the Civil War. Calling up of volunteers to suppress the rebellion uh, causes the Civil War and access to the territories causes the Civil War. So who is to blame? Is it Thomas Jefferson for uh, helping to uh, push states' rights uh, thinking and uh, political theory in the United States? Or is it James Madison for writing a constitution and helping to get a constitution crafted that left too many unanswered questions and, and in fact, in effect, uh, protected slavery? Uh, what Was it Alexander Hamilton? You know, Alexander Hamilton said, look, we can get rid of slavery by essentially uh, compensated manumission, uh, and then the way we will do that is we will buy slaves from their owners, and in order to finance that, we'll essentially float paper, you know, we'll just finance it by borrowing the money, uh, and he went as far as to actually have an amateurization schedule that says even if the United States bought every slave that was around in the 1790s, they'd have them paid off by the 1840s. Or was it this guy, John Locke? Um, Locke believed that the rights or, or government derived its power by consent of the governed. And so if there is a group of people that no longer feel as though their government is legitimate, shouldn't they throw it off? So, wow, we've got Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, Locke, all these guys to blame. Or was it slavery? Was it the fact that slavery existed, that slavery was cruel and inhuman? Uh, was it a necessary evil? a labor system to exploit the bounty of the continent, or was it an unnecessary evil and peculiar? Uh, slavery, after all, helped drive American expansion, and it's actually fueled by demand. If people weren't buying slave-produced products, if northern factories weren't using slave-produced cotton, uh, would slavery have been as vital to the United States? I mean, think about the expansion of the United States. It happens in several pulses, and what's driving it? <laughs> this desire to bring cropland into production and product to market. Well, at the same time that the United States is having a bunch of questions unanswered, but also has an economic machine that is really starting to gin up, pardon the pun, uh, what's going on with their nation south of the border? Well, it's chaos. First, the Spanish are experiencing chaos in the twilight of their great American empire. And um, after the Spanish leave, you have the chaos of the early years of Mexico. What do we have entering into the middle of all this? Americans. 
that are looking to move into Texas. You remember these guys. We've got Moses Austin and Stephen F. Austin, who began to move settlers into Texas, American settlers into Mexican Texas. Well, now we're getting the closer, in my opinion, to the proximate cause of the Civil War. See, the Austins introduced legitimate settlers into Texas, and these immigrants that come into Mexican Texas are anticipating entering a nation that is essentially America light. In fact, by 1830, there's 40,000 of these Texians that have moved into Texas. Have they come here legally or illegally? Well, both, but both legal immigrants through the impresario system and illegal immigrants just following other people's leads and kind of swimming over the river, the Sabine or the Red, uh, setting up farms in East Texas, all of these Americans assume that what they're getting in Mexican Texas looks a lot like what they're leaving in the American South. They're expecting great expanses of acreage where they can run livestock and other acreage where they can introduce slave-operated plantations. Okay, so they think they're coming to Texas to get America light. They think they're going to be able to pursue their new lives pretty much like they had pursued their old lives that their culture won't change just a heck of a lot by coming to a foreign country as an immigrant. Uh, but what they actually find is Mexico in chaos. And all of these newcomers see everything that they had hoped and aspired to being sucked into the vortex of Mexico psychosis. So what do they do? They secede. <laughs> they secede from Mexico. And in fact, you have what we refer to as the Texas Revolution because it kind of evokes the American Revolution and what the Mexicans refer to as the secession of Texas. Okay. Well, the Republic of Texas then is formed and operates from 1836 to 1846 for all intents and purposes. And that is essentially the spoil of this war, this secession movement. Well, the reason it's a republic for a decade is because of slavery. We've had this conversation. Remember, one Massachusetts lawmaker said, we will secede, we, South, we Massachusetts will secede if Texas is annexed, to which a South Carolina uh, representative, South Carolinian, uh, responds, go ahead. We would rather have Texas than Massachusetts. So clearly, Texas is going to be a flashpoint in this sectional, uh, growing sectional crisis. Even so, Texas is annexed, becomes part of the United States, and the last president of the Republic of Texas, Anson Jones, says the Republic of Texas is no more. Well, Mexico is not real crazy about this, and they are threatening threatening war, threatening a reaction to the annexation of Texas. The United States Army rushes in, uh, and now all of a sudden you have the shaping up of a conflict between the U.S. and Mexico. And in fact, over the course of the next two years, you have active combat operations between American armies and Mexican armies. In the middle of all of that, Texans begin to earn a reputation. I mean, if you go back and really think about it objectively, um, Texans did not show particularly well in their revolution. Think about it. The Alamo was not particularly a roaring Texas success. Uh, the destruction of Fannin's command at Goliad was not a roaring Texas success. And in fact, San Jacinto was almost an accidental battle. But 
the Mexican War more than the Texas War for Independence or the Texas Revolution. The Mexican War cements the Texans' military reputation. And in fact, you hear uh, phrases like the sons of San Jacinto uh, in reference to Texas volunteers serving with the American Army. One newspaper man referred to Texans as the American centaur. These guys are rough and tumble. Um, at the same time, the Republic of Texas has cultivated military prowess as a necessary aspect to hold office and to have public respect. Uh, 80% of Texans had, that were in elected office had at one time or another uh, borne arms during the course of the Republic, for instance. Well, how does all of this play out? After the war with Mexico, there is, of course, the Mexican Cession. The Mexican Cession essentially is a passage of land from Mexican control into American control. And it includes places like California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Utah, Colorado, uh, all that, the American Southwest that we know today. The question, though, becomes, who owns this new real estate? And here's why. Real estate lies below the compromise line from the Compromise of 1820, the Missouri Compromise. So does that mean that all this new newly acquired territory from Mexico is open to slavery? If it is, this allows the pro-slavery faction in the United States to get around the flank of the anti-slavery faction in the United States. All right, so stay with me. Now we're getting to the proximate cause of the American Civil War. The settlement of American immigrants into Texas and their subsequent war for independence and later Texas's annexation to the United States, which then precipitates war between the United States and Mexico, in essence, uh, leads to the Mexican Cession and the question over whether slavery can expand into the Mexican Cession causes an aggravation of the sectional crisis within the United States. So, roundabout, Stephen F. Austin caused the Civil War. If he hadn't moved those people in, none of this would have started. Well, all right, perhaps that's a little over the top, but you see how history is a chain of events. There's a number of dominoes that fall, and they fall in a particular sequence. So now that we have established that Texas, and in particular Stephen F. Austin, has caused the Civil War, how does it win the Civil War? Well, the Civil War starts as a sectional crisis, remember. And it's a sectional crisis and not a particularly bloody crisis uh, in the 1850s. From 1854 with the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act and this idea of popular sovereignty determining whether or not slavery would be uh, allowed in this new territory, all the way to the Act of Secession in 1861. So Texas is essentially becoming more and more Southern during this decade and more and more aligned with Southern interest. So when secession occurs in 1861, Texas is a super Confederate state. Well, why did they secede? There's a really easy solution to this. Uh, clearly, I mean, we can talk about all the things we've talked about before, constitutional, economic, slavery, etc., but let's take a look at the great seal of the Confederate States of America. The central motif in the great seal of the Confederate States is George Washington. Why did the South secede? Because they were protecting, they were defending what they believed was the original intent of the founders of this country. Essentially, they were seceding to keep America the way that George Washington would have wanted it. 
Interesting. That makes the Northerners the radicals and the revolutionaries. Completely backwards to the way that story is usually told, I understand. Well, Texans, being the American centaurs and with a military reputation to uphold, they throw in. Look, Texas is overwhelmingly young and male. And this is a place where young men are looking for an adventure. And by golly, this is their adventure. Just like their daddies had adventures in Mexico and fighting Mexicans or Indians. And their grandpappies had adventures in the 18, War of 1812. And even their great-grandpappies had adventures in the American Revolution. Well, this new generation, this young generation of Texans, this is going to be their war. And they expect that it will be brief and glorious. Well, there's another reason that Texans are throwing in. See, there's a latent idea that Texas has been denied its true majesty. You know, Texas gave up territory from its original republic footprint in the Compromise of 1850. So perhaps some of that territory can be regained with an active military campaign in the West. If nothing else, Texas stands to gain if Confederate troops can move all the way to the Pacific Ocean because then Texas will be the great jumping off point to a transcontinental Confederate nation. Well, all this is pretty heady stuff and much of it is very fanciful. But what did Texas actually do in the war? Well, nearly 90,000 of its young men, which is nearly its entire uh, military-aged population, serve in some form of Confederate unit. Um, Confederates had a much higher possibility of becoming a casualty than northern troops. In fact, probably 50% of Confederates uh, become casualties. So you have a one in two chance of becoming a casualty if you're a Confederate, but if you're a Texas Confederate, uh, you only have a one in five chance. And that's because of where Texans served and because of the way the war played out. North Carolinians die in the largest numbers, followed by Virginians. Texans do their part but they're not bled white like in other states. Uh, there's a representative group of Texans in the Army of Northern Virginia. There are Texas brigades in Tennessee, in Mississippi, in Georgia. Uh, there's famous brigades, not only Hood's in Virginia, but Granbury's Brigade and Ector's Brigade in the Army of Tennessee, Ross's Cavalry Brigade and Wharton's Cavalry Brigade operating in Mississippi and Tennessee. And then there's also units in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Indian Territory. There's Texans everywhere. You know, I've mentioned uh, the New Mexico campaign several times. What happens there? We probably ought to talk about that. Texas essentially writes an interesting chapter in its history, or these Texas troops write an interesting chapter in its state's history, by invading New Mexico with the idea of separating that desert southwest from the United States. In essence, it's Confederate Manifest Destiny. What the Texans discover when they go to New Mexico is that that territory is not worth, to quote Henry Hopkins Sibley, a quarter of the blood and treasure that was spent in its conquest. One other Texan put it a little more uh, comically, or certainly romantically. He said, you know what? New Mexico is the best trick old Mexico ever played on the United States, <laughs> making us take that territory. And I would remind everyone that when the United States chose to detonate its first nuclear weapon, it figured New Mexico would do. So uh, there is something of a, a legacy to that. All right, all that aside, uh, how many regiments and a regiment is the basic element of an army in the mid-19th century, come from Texas. About 70. Uh, 22 infantry regiments and about 44 to 48 cavalry regiments, depending on how you count them, and about 25 artillery batteries. So they are overwhelmingly mounted troops, but 
when these mounted troops get to the armies uh, in Arkansas and in Mississippi, um, horses are expensive. They're tough to upkeep. Most of the horses are sent home. Not every Texan who joins a cavalry regiment serves mounted <laughs> during the course of this war. Now, what did they do in the Army of Northern Virginia? They did a lot in the Army of Northern Virginia. In fact, Robert E. Lee refers to them as his Grenadier Guard. The first time that the President of the Confederacy ever reviewed the Texans, I mean, the Texans are getting off the trains up there in Virginia, and they're forming up on the plains of Manassas, at, and this is after the uh, Manassas campaign, and these troops are about to move up and picket the Potomac River. Uh, Jefferson Davis reviews the troops, and here's what he says about the Texans that are arriving in Virginia. He said, the troops of other states have their reputations to gain. The sons of the Alamo have theirs to maintain. So, high expectations. And the Texans do not disappoint. And in fact, at the Battle of Antietam, the Federal Army outnumbers the Confederate Army by better than two to one. And they are going to crush the Confederate Army, finish this war once and for all. The Union plan is to attack in echelon. So you'll attack from the north of the line and keep going down the length of the line with each unit coming in and putting additional pressure. And the, ad the idea is to kill down this part of the Confederate Army, then this part of the Confederate Army, so that no part of the line can go and reinforce the other. At one particular part of this battle early on, the men of Hood's Texas Brigade by themselves thrown in at a brigade strength, about a thousand men, to thwart the advance of an entire Union Corps, about 6,000 men. Heavily outnumbered, the Texans still went in near the Miller Farm and um, for 15 intense minutes fought desperately and actually blunted the Union advance. In this particular fight, 282 men of the 1st Texas Infantry went in, and they suffered 82% casualties, nearly entirely wiped out. There's a quote about the 1st Texas that Major General John Bell Hood passes into history. He said the 1st Texas Regiment had lost in the cornfield fully two-thirds of its number, and whole ranks of brave men whose deeds were unrecorded, save in the hearts of loved ones at home, were mowed down in heaps to the right and left. Never before was I so continuously troubled with the fear that my horse would further injure some wounded fellow soldier lying helpless upon the ground. Well, Lee's Grenadier Guard had other days in which they showed well. Uh, at the Battle of the Wilderness, once again, there's a big hole that appears in the Confederate line, and the Federals are starting to pour through it. Reinforcements are coming up the road, and in the vanguard of this column is the Texas Brigade, this time under a general by the name of Gregg. Their commander, Major General Evander M. Law, said this about the Texans' contribution that day, on the Battle of the Wilderness. The Federals were advancing through the pines with apparently resistless force when Gregg's 800 Texans, regardless of numbers, flanks, or supports, dashed directly upon them. There was a terrific crash mingled with wild yells which settled down into a steady roar of musketry. In less than 10 minutes, one half of that devoted 800 were lying upon the field dead or wounded. But they had delivered a staggering blow and broken the force of the federal advance. Again, another time when Texans saved the day. Well, likewise, Texans showed well in the Army of Tennessee. Uh, Granbury's Brigade, part of Claiborne's division, ended up becoming known as essentially the Hood's Texas Brigade of the, Ar of the Army of Tennessee. And Claiborne is the Stonewall Jackson 
of the Army of Tennessee. Well, if we're going to talk about Texas in the American Civil War, we really need to talk a lot about the Trans-Mississippi Theater. After all, that's where most of the Texans served. In particular, Louisiana absorbs a lot of Texas military resources and has a lot of attention paid to it by Texas troops. The reason's pretty simple. One of the men serving with Tom Green stated it this way, The battles of Texas will be fought in Louisiana. Therefore, it behooves us to strike for our homes. So if you tear up Louisiana, you may be able to avoid tearing up Texas. And that's essentially what happens. But the war does come to the state of Texas a number of times. The uh, federal navy, federal authorities, seized Galveston in October of 1862. Even so, Confederate forces under John B. Magruder were able to retake the town on New Year's Day, 1863, in a very dramatic land-sea assault that utilizes so-called cotton clads, essentially river boats loaded up with cotton bale armor. Now, this cotton bale armor was supposed to uh, protect landing forces that would then ram into the enemy ships and board them and capture them by boarding, old-fashioned. Um, it's funny, though, the uh, cotton bales really were just for peace of mind. When one of the soldiers asked the skipper of the Bayou City, one of the two cotton clads involved, will this cotton actually turn a cannonball? He says, well, heavens no. But don't tell everybody, and we'll just see what they can do with it. <laughs> so anyway, the Battle of Galveston ends up being a dramatic victory, the kind of victory that Texans like to crow about. Well, not only that, in September of 1863, there's even a more dramatic victory uh, at the Battle of Sabine Pass. In this particular engagement, federal authorities are going to put ashore about 5,000 men. The only thing they have to get by is a small earthwork uh, defended by about 40 Houstonians under the command of Captain Richard Dick Dowling. Uh, surprisingly, the Federals can't pull it off. These Houstonians had been practicing and training their guns for some time, and so when the Federal gunboats came up, they essentially started hitting them right off. First shot, uh, knocked out their uh, uh, steam drums, caused them to go aground, and captured two Union gunboats. The rest of the Union invasion force uh, waves off and returns to Louisiana. So once again, Texans were able to bring off a victory in a very dramatic fashion against very long odds. It adds to sort of the Texas legend and lore. So here's how Texas Confederates are able to... Um, kind of hold their heads up high, even though the Confederacy collapses and the cause is lost. See, Texas was sufficiently bloodied. Uh, there was enough casualties, if you will, enough battles that Texans were involved in, that they could say, we did our part. Uh, not only that, they earned great reputations as soldiers, especially in places like the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of Tennessee. Uh, high profile leaders like Robert E. Lee knew his Texans were good and didn't mind telling people about it. Other uh, fights that Texans were involved in, they always seem to be doing their part. And in effect, they're in all the major battles of the American Civil War. When it comes to invading Texas, Texans defend their own state with great style. So when the Texans come marching home from the war, what do they find? Unlike their um, comrades from other states, when Texans came home, they found their farms largely intact, uh, wild cattle dotting the prairies. The economy had actually kind of bounced a bit because Texas's geography next to Mexico made it the import-export center of the Trans-Mississippi, and uh, even when U.S. troops do arrive to enforce Reconstruction, their occupation is fairly remote and relatively benign. So, the rest of the South is devastated. Places like Louisiana, Virginia, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, 
torn up, ravaged. Texas is intact. And it's not very long before Northerners come to Texas and say, hey, we would like to start cutting some business deals. You see, we've used up all of our stock of uh, beef herds in the north. We've been feeding armies. But you guys have a lot of cattle that we would like to buy from you. So if you can get your cattle to our railroads, we might have a partnership. Texans leap at the opportunity, and it's cattle driving that ends up becoming one of the great engines of economic recovery in Texas. Well, since Texas is still intact, it's not been burned over, there's a way forward economically, you guessed it, it becomes a magnet for immigrants. Uh, immigrants from the rest of the South. These guys would essentially go to their burned out cabins and homes, carve GTT on the doorpost, gone to Texas, and try to start over in a new land. The population of Texas begins to really gather momentum. It's amazing the number of immigrant maps that are uh, issued in the post-Civil War period, drawing people to Texas and showing them the best roads and routes. Texas is just a magnet for Southerners to rebuild their lives and get on with it. Well, as a result, in many ways, Texas becomes more Confederate after the Civil War than it was even during the Civil War because it becomes the Confederacy distilled. You've got South Carolinians, Tennesseans, Georgians, all sorts of former Confederates that are relocating to the state. You can't go anywhere in Texas and see a cemetery without Confederate veterans buried there from other states because Texas was where they were coming to start over. So now Texas has a Confederate identity that takes its place right alongside its old Republic identity. The difference between Texas and the rest of the defeated South is that Texas can choose which identity to identify with depending on the circumstances. It's almost like a toggle switch. So if the controversy gets to be a little too uh, ferocious uh, about the Confederacy and Texas's role in slavery and in the uh, Confederate experiment, uh, Texans can simply step away and say, Confederacy, let's talk about the Alamo instead. So, at the end of the day, Texas wins the Civil War by doing everything it took to be a good citizen of the South without having to be burdened by the crushing defeat. So, with cool alternative identities, Texas wins. They prove their sincerity. They kept their state uninvaded, their farms un unscathed. Uh, they can step away from the train wreck if they feel like it. All that means that Texas essentially gets a get-out-of-jail-free card. And, in the post-Civil War period, becomes one of the most dynamic places in the American South, both economically, population-wise, and Texas clearly has a great future ahead of it.